Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of 10,000 Heroes. Today, my guest is Stephen Jenkinson, and many of you know his work. And if you know it, you've probably been touched by it, as I have. And I was really touched by this conversation. I was changed, and I hope you will be too, in the best of all possible ways. Before we get started, I just want to mention three things that I loved about this interview, because they really exemplify exactly what we're trying to do with this podcast. The first is that I never asked Stephen directly what his purpose is, even though that's really what I want to do with everyone. And it just comes out so clearly. He's just exuding it in the way he talks, the way he does everything, the way he doesn't answer my questions, the way he does his work. And that, um, that's, you know, that's what I'm trying, trying to get out of people. And the second comes basically directly out of that is that he's just this example of what I contend is possible for all of us, where we can really change the world by being ourselves. I mean, he's just so completely, authentically himself, and he's such a contribution for anyone who runs across him. So it's just that um, the nakedness of that authenticity and the clarity of that connection just really struck me in, in re-listening to the show. And the third is that we get to some really deep truths that are not his standard shtick. You know, like most of the guests I have have a message, they have a platform, they have something they're trying to repeat over and over and trying to convince us of. But um, it's not always what I want to hear. I want to go behind that and get to the purpose and the motivation and the substructure, you know, like kind of what's motivating the person. And we get there a couple of times and it's, it's beautiful, it's intimate. And you know, I just, I love those moments. So it really, for me, there was so much about this show that just is why I love doing this. So just wanted to share that with you all and so excited for you to hear this episode. Let's jump in. And as, as always, if there's anything you like, anything you don't, any suggestions you have, any guests you think we should have on the show, please get in touch. I love the feedback. I love the engagement. Every time someone does it, I'm just titillated. So thank you. Let's jump in. Fantastic. Well, I'm Ankur, and we've met once before, but in a kind of asymmetric way where the the lights were pointed at, at you, so I got to see you a little better than you got to see me. Ah, well, that happens in that arrangement. It's, as I said, you know, you're backlit, I'm forelit. Yeah. Well, and I'm just really grateful that I have this opportunity and that you said, you said yes, and grateful to explore a little bit more about what you shared with me the other night in Port Townsend. Hey, great. How yeah. long are we going for? Um, I leave an hour and a half and... I'm not really fussed about that. So okay. I have space after that and we could end early and this is yeah, I mean, yeah. I, This is butchering and slaughtering season right now. Mm. And I just left it to come here and I have oh. to go back. So yeah. an hour is what I've got, I think. Maybe let's just get a sense of what is it like for you in butchering and slaughtering season? Well, it's physically taxing and it's psychically taxing too, because you are taking life and you know it for weeks. Well, you know it all year round, but for weeks ahead of time, you're planning, you're making all the decisions on behalf of the greater good of the farm as to who stays and who doesn't and all of that. And then the day comes and it was yesterday for us where a lot of lives leave the place, you know, and it's a, it's a devout thing and it asks a tremendous amount as it should, you know, it's the responsibility you take on. When you agree to do this, you're not going to live by the fertilizer industry and various other similar things. But so when you banish the, the predator from the farm, as you virtually must do if you plan to make it any kind of a go at it, then you have to replace the predator because the predator is the apex benefactor of your, your flock, your herd, whatever you've got. And so that takes the form of exactly this time of year, doing what we're doing and then butchering thereafter which is a very, very long and tedious process that take everything I'm describing to you probably takes in the neighborhood of two and a half to three weeks, seven days a week. And, and I've got to try to make peace with the fact that I won't be here because I'm on the road again in two days, I think, to reacquaint myself with the band and, and do the tour and, you know, right through to the middle of December. So I feel both burdened and lucky and truant all at the same time. Burdened and lucky and truant. Yeah. A little bit of a, a cocktail. It is. Sometimes yeah. Molotov variety. Yeah. Have you ever been vegetarian? 
Hell no, man. Um, Around here, they have a bumper sticker. Tell me. It, no, I'll tell you. They've got a bumper sticker here. Or maybe it's not a bumper sticker. Maybe, we have an Algonquin reserve at the end of the lake here. And I have a few friends over there. And occasionally they'll joke and they say, oh, <laughs> vegetarian. That means bad hunter. So I'm not alone. Yeah, there's an interesting... I've, I've been vegetarian for most of my adult life. And there's an interesting... Ah, what's the word? Maybe fiction or theater. Like part of it is this, this not, not wanting to participate in the interspecies cycle of life and death. Though, of course, it's inescapable, right? Like every, everything I eat also lived and died and was killed intentionally, right? Correct. Can't get out, you know, there's no real grief bypass for a conscious human being. There isn't. And that seems to be architectural, you know, not punitive, just architectural. Seems to be metabolic and structural and skeletal. And it's mythic and poetic at the same time. And uh, it doesn't leave you out. That's not an affliction. That's called inclusivity these days. Hmm. Yeah. And so what do you, what do you see? I mean, you're the, the show that you, that you are currently touring on, which I saw a couple of weeks ago. It, this is at the, maybe at the heart of it, or at least the heart of my experience of watching it is this, the grief and, um, the inevitability of the experience of grief or say, my, my inclusion in the experience of grief. Right. What is, what is the invitation? What is like the spiritual invitation for growth there that you can see? I don't know if there is one. I myself am not a fan of growth for all kinds of reasons, chief of which being that everywhere I look where growth is a sort of value unto itself, untethered to the consequences of its pursuit. Yeah, it it's, has its own reward and so on and so on. I'm, I'm brought to mind over and over again of suburbs. Well, really, I mean, that's what, what's what, and, and also I worked in the death trade, right? So I was in oncology a lot and it's no accident that they use that word to describe tumor. Okay, they don't call it atrophy, they call it growth. Well, there's a reason for that because growth for its own sake, well, think of how a tumor does its work. It's uh, we, uh, we attribute all kinds of nefarious devilry to a tumor, but a tumor is, uh, you know, is just going about its, its understanding of itself with oftentimes with relentless efficiency. And, and what does it do? It grows itself to death. That's what it does. I mean, does that sound familiar? Surely it does. No. So can you somehow rescue growth from that particular scenario and, and sort of redeem it in some fashion? The answer is, no, man, I don't think so. We've got growth means increase. That's what it means. Now, if you want to opt out of that arrangement, you probably can't use the word growth to characterize, you know, whatever you have in mind. But increase, especially for people who look like me in this world, I mean, we've had our day with increase. Let's just say that. And let's just know it for, for the crude and brutal fact that it is. That uh, we, we've had our time with increase for its own sake, be it inner or outer. And the world is not better off for having, us having done so. So at the very least, it's time for zero growth of a kind of intellectual and, and mythic and poetic kind, I would say. Learning to live with less surely also includes learning how to live with less elaborate sense of oneself. So all of that is a pre preamble to your question or to my answer to it, which is something like this. Don't forget the nights, it's called nights of grief and mystery. It's not called nights of grief and grief and just when you thought it was over more grief. That's not what it's called. And so these things are twins of a kind. So you could say mystery is a grievous thing, and I would agree with you completely. And you could say grief is a mysterious thing, and I'd be with you there too. So the invitation there is to inhabit fully the responsibilities of citizenship in a time of trouble. That's what it is. That's the invitation. If there is, ah, invitation is too subtle and too strong. It's much closer to an exhortation, isn't it? It's much closer to me saying something sort of, you really don't have a choice in this matter. Your, your, only, your only choice is to choose poorly, really. The notion here is to submit 
to an understanding that's greater than what your sense of personal fulfillment might dictate. You know? And so P.S. on the end of that would be something like, it seems to me that you may remember this line or something like you. Life's mysteries are as mysterious when they work out for you as when they don't. Sometimes you can't even tell the difference. And if you decide prematurely that this is to your benefit, this is not to your benefit, you might screw the whole thing up desperately just because you got no patience. And because these things tend to resemble each other, the downside and the upside, the differences between them are not nearly as grandiose as I think we attribute to them. Ultimately, things working out well for the likes of you, where you are, and me for where I am, is a secondary criteria to the primary criteria, which is the world's got to be better off as a result of you and I being here. Not we've got to be better off as a consequence of the world being here. I think that's the plea of the, of the show. Yeah. Wow. And that, that really echoes or resonates with the plea of this this project, which is, you know, I call it 10,000 heroes. And the idea is to be part of people's journeys and figuring out how their life can be aligned into a contribution to the whole. But so, but I'm still confused about, about the growth thing. Cause if that's, if that's your intention, is that not a kind of growth that you're intending? Like a growth of understanding? Well, I can't, I can't see how you can elude the implication that growth means more. I mean, every time you're using it just now, I can hear very clearly, unless I'm, my hearing's no good anymore, that you do mean some kind of increase of some kind of substantial presence that wasn't there before, that takes up room in some fashion or other, even if it's mythic and poetic, imaginal room rather than another suburb. For me personally, since you're asking me, there's no sense in me hiding on the matter that when I look at the increase for its own sake, I'm brought back to tumor over and over and over again. And that's what I think, this is going to sound rather unnecessarily strong or vehement, but I think self-improvement is a kind of addiction to the tumor as aspect of life. I mean, it is a kind of life, you know, live, living in the presence of a tumor, we could grant is a kind of life but it draws heavily upon your capacity to live. That's what I think increase does, especially, maybe not exclusively, but especially now, and especially in the Anglo part of North America. I can't speak with any authority about any place else because I've only lucky enough to visit, but, I, you know, so with humility in place, that's the way it strikes me. We just don't need more of us. The world doesn't need one more human being. I mean, that's palpably clear. But at the same time, I think the world needs our humanity more than it needs humans. Yeah. So we could make the distinction. We could say fewer of us may be capable of an augmented humanity just by virtue of there being fewer of us and seeing the consequence of voluntary restraint in terms of appetite, in terms of procreation, in terms of fulfillment, in terms of me first, you know, all of those things. And what is, with relationship to that, in relationship to that idea, what is the intention of your show or your body of work? Like, how does it, how does it relate to that idea? Okay, well, those are two different things. The body of work is, is quite, it's this, you know, it functions on a certain scale over the years. Yeah. The show that you're asking me about is is more a dedicated proposition. And yeah. Let's let's start with the show, and then I'd love to see if there's some kind of thread or wholeness with the entire body of work. Well, you know, I called the I called the enterprise that I've engaged in for the last twenty years or something orphan wisdom, and the intention of that was to acknowledge two things and to argue and to contend at the same time. The acknowledgement was people who look like me on this continent don't belong here. Full stop. No qualification, no buts. That's the way it is. Now, it's not the same declaration as people who look like me shouldn't be here. That's a different calculation, a different conclusion. 
And there's a different spirit that inhabits that observation. That's not an observation. That's exhortation, you see. So, but the acknowledgement, it belongs. We don't, belo- we don't belong here. Then we, we're d- desperately proving the point virtually every day by how we conduct ourselves as if, as if we own the joint, right? Not as if it's, it's given to us for safekeeping for a very limited part, you know, portion of time. So I have no idea what that just was. Did you hear that? Oh, there was some, some kind of sound of God kind of thing that accompanied the last thing I said. I don't know what it was. Anyway, and the wisdom part, well, you know, people like me are having their time in the shade, let's just say in the shadows now. It's a given that it was coming. It's a kind of pendulum. And anybody who's got this demeanor and this complexion and so on has had their day in the sun. And this is not then, that that's gone. And I don't really lament it. I, I think I understand it quite well. And I'm not sure that I welcome it, but I certainly acknowledge the historical legitimacy of it. Yeah. So along comes with that is a, a high degree of an intense and toxic degree of self-hatred that's masquerading as a conscience among people who look like me. And the consequence for that is, among other things, a complete disavowal and disowning of one's ancestry. Now, I, I deem that to be perhaps the most destructive thing people like me have put into motion in this world. And that's saying so. <laughs> There's a big menu. Yeah. It's really saying so, I know. But what do I mean? I mean the consequences for, for swearing off your own ancestry. Oh, man, among others, one of the consequences, people look like me searching out people who look like you, isn't it? For some kind of a direct transmission guidance and beneficence and, of course, acceptance and approval and praise and all the rest. It's rather an infantile arrangement, isn't it? Or infantilizing in some fashion. I mean, I, I'll tell you a little story. I haven't related this. It happened just a couple of months ago. I do an interview with someone, though she grew up in the United States. She is, uh, I think, Vietnamese ancestry. And I, I think it was at least three times she used the phrase, people like you. So it, it became pretty clear by the third time out that this was a, a racial observation that she was uh, obtaining and employing, right? So not, a, not about your fashion sense. I don't think so. No, unless they're indivisible, but I don't think so. And so, and where it went was, she said something in the order of, I hope I do it justice. That just was, you know, for the longest time, people who looked like me used to go to people like you for guidance and, 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 and elderhood and, uh, that, and so on like this. I really wanted to say, wow, it's amazing, you know, because people who look like me are doing the same thing to people who look like you. But I didn't say it because it was just, just too much one-upmanship, you know. And uh, she needed the point to be made without being responded to. And so I, I just let it go. But I, I relate it now to say, these things all count, you see. The, the, the consequences are in real time for all of this stuff. And I don't think most of it is corrective. It's reactive. And there's a world of difference between those two things. And, uh, you know, desperate to be on the right side of history, so many people are now, to be vindicated simply by the passage of time. So... It's a, I, I use the term orphan wisdom to characterize the distinct possibility that people who are culturally orphaned, it doesn't mean they have no lineage. It generally means they can't gain any kind of direct or practice access to their lineage, to their, to their cultural patrimony and so on. And so I'm, I'm trying to suggest I'm holding people with that kind of annihilating self-hatred to a higher standard. I'm saying, here's the thing. If you are ancestrally are capable of something that we could genuinely acknowledge to be wisdom, you have no out clause and your self-hatred is not serving you. You're still on the hot seat to deliver the goods in a troubled time because you're capable of wisdom. And there's such a thing as wisdom that comes from where you come from. And the sooner you get hip to that and assume it as a functioning responsibility, the better off people who don't look like you will be. That's why I call it orphan wisdom. And that is a through line, I think, to everything. Everything I've been trying to do for the last 20 years. As per the Knights of Grief and Mystery particularly, it has a different, a different cradle than it was born in. 
because it was, it was something I wasn't looking to do. I mean, I was a one-man show and, you know, given that I'm Leo, they tell me that that's part of the deal. You know, you just, you just insist on a certain amount of workroom and you can't really accommodate other people. And I didn't. I mean, this guy presented himself and, you know, when he thanked me for the time of us just meeting, he just said as a PS in his thank you note, if you're ever looking for a band, I know this guy, dot, dot, dot. That's what he said. I'd never, I wasn't looking for any band. But I tell you this, in this, you see, you can't make this up. In the same week, I got a letter from an American charitable trust organization saying, we want to give you money, quite a bit of money, actually. And the reason we want to do that is to use the money so that your work becomes more available to us here in the United States. I said, okay. Well, they said, now you just have to apply for it. And then there's a whole rigmarole about nonprofit and, you know, all that stuff. But finally, we made it happen. So literally in the same week, I said a guy who offered to be a band for something that didn't exist, you know, it wasn't really backing me up as it turned out. It was something else. At the same time, that the funding to do exactly that came forward. So what do you call that? I, could, I call that God's finger up your nostril pulling. That's what it is to me. So you'd be foolish to go, well, I don't know, you know, I'd like to use the money for some other thing or... Or, well, what kind of music do you, no, it was never, it was never in question. I recognized the kind of luminous symmetry of the thing. And I obeyed as best as I could figure out how to do it. And within two weeks, yeah, with no rehearsal of any kind, we were in a sold out recital hall in New York City, looking at each other going, now what? That's how that started. That's seven years ago. And that's Greg Hoskins, who was doing the performance with you. Correct. Yeah. 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 And, and so I could say that, you know, in a more firm answer to your question, the Knights of Griffin mystery is a ceremony. It's not like a ceremony. It's not ceremonial. It's a ceremony, which is why it begins the way it does. I'm not, I don't expect you to remember the beginning, but the gist of it is a prayer. We call it between ourselves. We call it the invocation. That means to put it to voice, putting something to voice. And it's, uh, you know, begins, let's see if I remember. So you've heard this, I've heard it too. Summoned or not, they say the gods will be present. Maybe, I say. Sounds like bad manners. Probably going to bring some bad luck and nobody knows. So, welcome friends. Who am I talking about? Everybody in the room thinks I'm talking to them when I say welcome friends. No, it follows directly upon me saying, so summoned or not the gods? No, they got stuff to do. And we might not be the top of the list for once. So we might actually have to plead for their presence rather than just accept, expect it. So that's what it is. And it's a, it's a case-making proposition. In other words, I'm making the case that the gods might not be wasting their time. Anyway, we could use the help. I could go on, but I think you want to jump in here. Please go ahead. I, I do. I want, to, I want to go back to the, the orphan wisdom kind of concept because I think there's something for me to learn there. And maybe I'll give you a little bit of my background so we can ident identify that. So my family's from India. I was born in the States, you know, grew up on the West Coast, California, Washington State, and had a very traditional material education, you know, math, computer science, philosophy. And so the notion that there is some wisdom in my ancestors that's begging to be expressed through me that is different than the wisdom I could learn from another cultural tradition is a bit of a foreign notion. And I, and I say that as someone who went back to India as an adult and spent five years learning all of these traditions there, meditation, yoga, classical music, Ayurveda, cooking, and it totally transformed me. So even though I've had that experience, it's still intellectually, I want to say, well, Stephen, I could have gone to China and spent five years in China and learned all the meditative traditions of China, and it'd be the same. But I think you're saying, no, it would not have been the same. Well, we could at least, at the very least, acknowledge to each other that it may, this is all hypothesis now, it may end up being the same for you. You didn't finish the sentence. But when I'm talking about ancestry, I'm talking about those, those guys too. And it may not be the same outcome for them if you went to China. 
surely to God, this is what prayer is. I'm just going to plead and make a case at the same time. Most pray, as I've heard it described and invoked and referred to, it's rare to begin with. But when it materializes, it's basically a variation on the theme of gimme, gimme, I ain't got. It, I'm so unworthy, or what, you know, that whatever the case that you think you're making by referring to your worthiness as a linchpin in this whole thing. I think that what, when prayer is not petitioned for, for amplitude, it includes acknowledgement of the consequences of formally making this prayer for the receiving end of it. Now, that's as rare as hen's teeth, as we say around here. So I've never heard it, to be honest. But when you grow up as a staunch, involuntary monotheist, as most people who look like me on this continent have done, then you come with, you, you involuntarily come to the notion that, that, oh, if you're talking about the divine, if you're talking about the holy, if you're talking about the deities, if you're talking about God or gods, singular or plural, here's the job description of gods. They got enough. Don't you worry about them. And you know, without thinking that for a second, that whole assumption of amplitude transports itself across the, I don't know what no man's land it might be, and affixes itself to your understanding of your ancestry as well. So you can't possibly impoverish your ancestors by anything you do or fail to do in your life. Because they're dead. That's the, that's the idea. It's like, I'm alive, they're dead, I can't affect them. That's, that's the belief you're talking about. Yes? Well, even, no, no, it's not. It, no. Even if you acknowledge that what you do could affect them, it could never diminish them. You see, because in their deadness, they are fulfilled. You see, this is the, the working assumption. I mean, there's no, there's no real scholarship that supports such, such a thing. But the degree to which people look at me, like me think about ancestry at all, they think of it, I believe, as a kind of Walmart. I've never been in a Walmart, but this is what they tell me. It's just endless possibilities. Just shelf after shelf of shit you don't need, right? And so this is how people seem to come to their ancestry. Only in times of trouble, never as a formal thing, always as a somewhat involuntary thing, in extremis, you know, when everything else fails, including you, suddenly they're a good idea. I mean, it's not an accident. It seems to me that you're dead, must eyeball God from time to time and go, man, this is a rough gig, isn't it? And God says, amen, this is a rough gig. The only time they ever come to us is when the shit hits the fan for them. And no acknowledgement over here, none whatsoever. So I think prayer, you know, properly, legitimately practiced is most of it is an acknowledgement of the consequence of all the neglect since the last time you prayed. Okay, wow. I'll get off my soapbox. What do you think? No, I, I love your soapbox now. So, I mean, so, so I, it brings to mind um, the Odyssey. I'm thinking of the Odyssey and I'm thinking of these giant pyres, right? That Homer wrote about that they would build. Yes, yes. That they would build as an offer, offering to the various gods. That's, that's another way of doing it, right? That's different. That's like, okay, I'm going to spend all this time offering before feeding. 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 What, and what do they eat? My, this is my guess. They don't eat what you offer. They eat the fact that you offered it. That's, the, that's what they consume. Little yeah. story that, gives, that substantiates this notion. Yeah. So I come into a Chinese restaurant, recently opened Chinese restaurant with a friend of mine. And we passed all these big bouquets and banners, and all, all written in Chinese, so we don't know what it says. And it draws attention to the front of the house, you know. But anyway, we get seated, and he says, what's up with that stuff up there? I said, well, I just their friends are wishing them good luck and stuff. No, no, he said the other thing. Oh, what other thing? He said, you know, there's this thing there. It's a bowl. There's rice in it. And there's like oranges and, and what do you call them? Uh, incense sticks and, and, and candles and like that. Oh, let's plug in because the, you know, the law doesn't let you, whatever it is. I said, so, so what's, why are you so mobilized on this thing? He said, what is that? I said, well, that's probably an altar, isn't it? He said, an altar to what? I said, not to what, for what probably. He said, tell me. I said, well, this is, this is their ancestry. He said, 
So why is there food there? I said, bingo, because it's for their ancestors, you see. Apparently, in this understanding, ancestors are not self-sufficient. Maybe they can get by, but maybe that's not good enough. Maybe a starvation diet would make them nuts or very unreliable, as it would us. I mean, all you're going to do is fast for 24 hours and you're a lunatic. Nobody, nobody can bear to be around you. So maybe it's the same. Anyway, he said, oh, really? I said, yeah, I think so. He said, so what happens to those oranges when they're best before they clicks by and the green mold starts coming on? I saw they probably end up in the dumpster in the back. He said, see, it's just symbolic. It's nothing real about the feeding. I said, you got the same problem I got. What's that? He said, I said, well, I can't tell the difference between an ancestor and a raccoon either. That's what I mean. When the raccoon is in the dumpster, maybe that's your people getting their due. Maybe. The fact that you didn't eat the orange is the thing. And that you deliberately set it aside for them and perhaps name them accordingly. I don't know. There's something about the willingness to do so, which is, I mean, can we say at worst it's inconvenient for us? But I mean, when the chips are down, isn't it? And you're, you're trying to come across with the goods because you got a child in the hospital or whatever it is. It's not three oranges in a dumpster anymore, is it? And it's not a question of whether it's convenient for you or now, is it? Or, or whether you've thought of it suddenly. Oh man, it's a whole other thing. And the first thing that comes in is that blood of regret for all of the times that you could have done this minus a crisis. And you never did. Because you were minus a crisis, as if the crisis is the real mothership, the real, what do you call it? Oh, God. What's the women who help a childbirth, what are they called? Midwife. Thank you. That as if crisis is the most legitimate midwife of the best part of you finally showing up for duty. That's what I meant by neglect or truancy before. I just feel um, just indicted. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. You, yeah. know the, you know the band No Doubt? Yeah, from the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, I know way back in the 90s, I know. So they had a song called What You Waiting For. That was the, ba that was the refrain. What you waiting, what you waiting, what you waiting for. Okay, that's the question. That's the great question of this moment. But don't make it rhetorical. Try to answer it. What are you waiting for for the best part of you to come forward consistently and, and without seeking approval first. Maybe you have to seek forgiveness, but you're not likely to get permission for that. What does it take? Well, you know, you know I worked in the death trade a long time. And you would think, oh man, somebody dying or appearing to be dying, that must be the time. You know what I'm here to tell you, don't you? No. What? You're joking. No. No. People die in the way they lived. People attend to dying people in the manner of their living too. So what you get is a more adamant version of what's always been there. It's, no, it's not transforming in the least. And this should be cause for something like a pause and something like a kind of primordial disappointment in oneself. Or to use your word, a kind of indictment that means you no harm. But it means you, though. There's, a, there's just something so, I don't know what the right word is. I, I don't want to say human, but it's the word that's coming to mind. I'm, I'm thinking of the times that you know you should do the stretching or yoga, and you don't, and you don't, and then you get the injury, and then you start doing it because it, it helps until the day you can walk normally again, and then you totally stop doing it. It's, it's, it's the same thing. You know, I had a child in the hospital. And in that moment, sure, I did everything. And I probably said, I'm, I'm going to like keep doing this, right? I'm going to keep right. communicating with you. I'm going to keep asking for help. I'm going to keep being humble. And, and do you? Do I? Until it's not bad enough anymore. Yeah. All I mean, the worst thing that happens to us is when shit starts to work out. It's like a recipe for, okay, good. All bets are off. Now, where were we? Where were we? That's what you want to go back to? I mean, think about this COVID yammer that's around them. I mean, all summer it was, what, back to normal. Back to normal. 
What normal do you got in mind? 2019. What? 2019? You mean the shit that got us here in the first place? That's what you want to give back to? And that's when the government's okay again, is it? So, I mean, I'm going to go back to this, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to avoid the word growth, but you're going to know that's what I'm thinking in my mind. <laughs> what's, you're, what's, not, you're not growing on this point of growth. You notice that. It, <laughs> what's, what's the pathway for evolution? If I want to not be like that anymore, can you help me? It's, yeah, it's, I think it's the wrong configuration to imagine this as evolution, growth, or anything else that's, that g- does this, that carries a sense of inevitable primacy about it. Okay, so how about this? Let's ask the question, what does it take? I was saying it a few minutes ago. I think we both acknowledge that even in our moments of, you know, just flaming insight, we can't wait to get over the insight, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Beautifully put. Okay. Yeah. There's something about it. It seems brilliant at the time, but it's even more brilliant to leave it aside. What? How is that brilliant? Okay. So then, how many heartbreaks do you want to count on? Or do you remember the last piece in the show? Why do we end the show with a piece called Regrets of All Things? Because I'm acknowledging exactly what we're talking about now. Down along the fence line in the back 40 of your life, there's a pile of stones there. And those would be your regrets. And if you don't go down there and visit them all the time, or at least sometime, you're going to end up thinking that there's none at all, or the pile's too high and there's no point, right? So when the ending of days comes into view, that's a good time to go down and visit that little altar. For the ending of days has turned it into a place to pray. That's how it begins. Okay, it's n- there's no growth promised, inferred, invoked, Nothing of the kind. There's a certain degree of learning that's a bit involuntary by picking up one of those stones at a time and getting its heft and getting its weight and getting it grain and getting it straight. I think that's the deal, man. I mean, I look around and there are exceptions, but they're called exceptions for a reason. For most of us walking wounded, for most of us civilians, man, it has to get worse and worse again. And the election cycle is the most egregious example of it. I mean, you just went through it, what, yesterday or whatever it was? And what? So now, all of a sudden, the climate thing, depending on who you're voting for, it's in or it's out. It's big or it's not big. Oh, it's the economy. Oh. And we're just so insanely inconsistent with our attention span. And, And this is, there's some devilry to be observed here. But because the powers that be on this machinery, the very one that you are employing right now, is investigating at every conceivable level what we bring to the fray when we log in and do all this stuff, when we watch a movie and all the rest. And, you know, people, quote unquote, know this. Wait a second. Before you just know this too, consider the real possibility that what they're doing is monetizing your anxiety because anxiety is the principal shopping list when you open this machine and you're going looking, you can call it a lot of other things, but you could feel the anxiety ramp up if you didn't open the machine, but you were mobilized by the same stuff inside. You just didn't act on it. You didn't do the automatic thing of flipping the lid and, and the thing goes bong and then you're off to the races. So that tells you about all you need to know. They found a way to sell you your own anxiety back to you as if they're doing you a favor. So then what does one do in a situation that insane and that Machiavellian? And my answer would be, you, you better start getting good at your anxiety and stop letting them sell it to you. So good with your anxiety that nobody can be better at your anxiety than you can. Now you become a discretionary presence on the internet, not an involuntary slave. Now Netflix doesn't get you every night. Now you're going to have to figure something out instead of Google it, you know, and a thousand other ways of conversing with people without benefit of the intermediary called this machinery. That's just picking one thing out of the air. But, you know, if the question is, what do we get, what, how, how does this not be as diabolical as it is? There's a lots of answers and I don't know most of them, but at the level of individual direct action, it's not excuse the language, it's not tearing the motherfucker down. It's simply learning how your involuntariness has been feeding the beast 
lo these many years. And that's what the, the adjective to be awake actually means. It's nothing to do with consciousness and all that. Sec- well, if it does, it's very secondary. The meaning of the word is almost observable. It's such a matter of physics. It's an old Anglo-Saxon word. So the A in front doesn't mean, it's not a negating prefix. It means of or pertaining to. And then the root word, we use it from time to time, don't we? If you, if you know any good Italians or Irish people and somebody dies, boom, there's a waking. Okay. Or secondarily, if you're making your way through water and you have on one of the ferries over you and you look behind you, there it is. So what's the condition of being awake? is the condition of being brought to an understanding of and being ensnared in the web of consequence that fans out from everything that you do and don't do and say and don't say and warrant and don't warrant, fess up to and don't and, you know, and on and on and on. And that's, you could say, well, it's shit, that's endless. Okay, well, it's endless. What's your point? Well, how can somebody possibly attend to these matters because there's too many of them? Well, the answer would be one at a time. That's how. One at a time. Don't use the fact that you emanate too many consequences as the reason to emanate one more unconsciously. See, sign up for duty, man. What you wait and what you waiting for. I can imagine that your, your sense, maybe I'll say meaning or, or dedication or import, is, is twin. You're doing this process in your own life. You can't not be, especially with all these specific examples. You're you're clearly operating on that level. And there's this other level of sharing where you're dropping these, dropping these pearls before us in the hope that we're able to receive them. In hope that you're not swine. Yeah. (laughs) Use a biblical analogy. Yeah. Is that accurate? You know, I neither confirm nor deny the allegation of prophecy, but I'm flattered by it, and I'll leave it there. It's easier to say these things than it is to do them. I mean, instinctively, we know this is true, right? If I have any particular gift with the language, it doesn't allow me an escape route out of the dilemma. It visits the dilemma upon me yet again. See, so if anything... The, the remarkable experience of all these interviews and so on, among others, has been for me to revisit whatever I'd grown accustomed to and to wonder whether or not that customization, I know that's not the meaning of the word, but I think you know what I mean by it, best serves the brief but intense period that I'm allotted here among you, right? And you can tell by my appearance now that I'm simply not standing in the place in my life that I did even before the pandemic. I'm clearly older than I was when that thing started. And clearly the world has changed that in a way that doesn't favor what I'm trying to do compared to how it was then. And the Knights of Grief and Mystery is harder to mount by far than it was before and on and on. So, so personally, you know, the invitation to, to wonder aloud with people about things, for me, is not a neutral endeavor. I'm not talking about myself. I'm not talking about what I want or what I saw. Well, I am talking about what I saw, but I'm not talking about my preferences or my opinions. God, no, especially not opinions. You know, I will be, I'm asked repeatedly about these things, and I say, look, it doesn't even matter if I agree or does, it, does, it doesn't, it barely matters to me. It matters less to you, or it should. No, there's, we have a different job, surely now, than weighing in on every damn thing, right? So one, one of the things I do is, I don't know if you can make up the... The, the skulls on the, on the teacup? Right, yeah. yeah. So, you know, when I'm drinking the elixir of life, in this case, matcha, which is way too much caffeine, but um, these guys wink at me as I go about replenishing myself. They say, go on then. Go on, mister. Forever and ever, amen. Go on then. But sooner than you know, you'll be among us. Any questions? See? There's no cleverness permitted in a moment like that. 
no turn of phrase, no pearls, no swine, no nothing. There's a kind of appear, apparently merciless reduction of grandiosity and, uh, and th- this is fitting, isn't it? It's fitting if, if I'm granted the occasional opportunity to stand before people and make a case for something and they'll sit there for longer than 10 minutes. What is that called? To me, that's called a privilege, but not a privilege the way it's sneeringly said today. I genuinely mean a privilege that retroactively I'm trying to earn. It's afforded me before I do very much. And then I stand there and I have to stand and deliver as if that's what it is. So that's the standard I hold myself to. And whether I'm talking to, you know, a, a live audience or in a situation like this, I revisit the language, the, the word hoard, as it's called in Old English. Yeah. And I, I try to serve it as best as I can figure out how to do at the time, which is why apparently they tell me I give good interview because there's not a lot of stock phrasing because I'm trying, I don't, I think stock phrasing in and of itself is disrespect to you, to me, but most especially to the language. And those from whom we do, we, you know, who granted it to us. And it's a perfectly legitimate language, even though it comes into sort of disrepute these days and everybody's language is better than English. Well, to a, someone gifted with English, that's not true. English can carry the freight, man, just as well in its fashion as a relatively young language, as say your ancestral tongue or tongues could do. Or it could say differently. And we could observe the following. You know, the world as it currently exists was crafted in the, in the presence of English as the dominant world language. From that point of view, then, we could say that English might be more adept at contending with the troubles of the times than a language that's millennia older than English in its current form. Maybe. And if that's true, at least we should, we should at least try to disprove it by doing well by the lane. So that's what you hear me doing. I really appreciate your, your humility and your conscientiousness. It really strikes me that you give, um, you give personhood to, to things that we don't normally consider people. You give personhood to this language. You give respect to the language, to the, to the idea of like the theater of being together, to the audience. You, you, you bow before it and treat it with respect. That's beautifully observed. You know, I, I recognize myself in, in what you're saying here. I'm not sure I resemble it, but I, I recognize it. And I think it's because I'm, I'm an unproven animist. That's what happened. Somewhere along the way, I got animated in that sense of the term. And I've never been able to set it aside because it's inconvenient. And so it informs my farming practice just as much as it informs what I'm doing with you now. And this moment, you know, I don't, I don't think there's such a thing as the future, personally. There's the past and there's the clearinghouse for the past called now. And, you know, I'm doing my utmost to inhabit now, mindful as I am buffeted by what has battered and bettered me, the past. And I'm conducting this, this strange little choral event in the presence of all that preceded me, you know? And I'm, I mean, maybe I'm saying to them like this or, but at least I'm mindful, you know? And I think the thing that helped me do that was being with so many dying people, all of whom are dead now, as you'd expect. And I never made a formal promise to them, but I, I was aware in subsequent years that they included me in the most uh, brittle and damaged time of their lives. And this constitutes both a privilege on the one side and some kind of obligation on the other side to proceed in your life as if you were there, you know. And, uh, and this is me translating that. Yeah. Yeah. That sense of obligation really, really echoes with me from all of the mm. travels I've done and people I've met and tender moments, there's, I have that sense too, to keep it alive. Oh yeah. You may be interested in the etymology of obligation. 
you know, the, the word itself has got a pretty bad PR firm working for it now in North America. Thou shalt not be obligated, right? Because it's bad form. Well, it's slavish and all the rest. Well, the word actually that L-I-G root is the same root as ligament and religion. So what does it mean? It means the temporary alignment. There's, an, there's the word again, L-I-G. The te temporary alignment of disparate things such that something is possible that wasn't possible prior or following their alignment. That's what your knee is. That's what your ankle is. That's what your shoulder is. That's what your life is. A temporary alignment of disparate things for the sake of something appearing by virtue of that alignment that wasn't there when they were disparate, that cannot remain indefinitely for it would atrophy and ossify. So this temporariness keeps its suppleness, you see, and its capacity to respond. And that's what a language is. And that's why we're given the, the tongue, the magic. And when you think what's done in the name of that magic, it's really tragic. You know, you know Stephen, I think I have I've this, blown up your question. I mean, that's the whole, the whole point of the question. I mean, they're just, they're just throwing seeds on fertile ground and just happy for whatever pops up. But the, okay. the whole... Um, I have this, this notion that whatever we think we're saying or whatever we think we're talking about, we're just always singing the song. And the song is, this is what it means to be me. This is what it means to be me. This is what it means to be me. Just this like, portrait of our multidimensional presence. And having this conversation with you is just so clear to me in my, in my subtle, fragile, limited understanding that you're, you're in alignment with what you're here to do. And you found a way to express yourself in a way that is deeply meaningful, both for you and for those you run across. And I, I thank you for that modeling. From your mouth to God's ear. I mean, I, you know, on my best, absolute best days, maybe I get close to what you imagined there, but I know for, for sure this much, that I'm not automatic. Now, the word automatic is a dangerous and odious word, actually. I have nothing, nothing to do with that reflex stuff, you know, that you have no voluntary control. That's not what automatic means. The word auto is basically the word for self. And then the M-A-T root or the M-A root is mother. So literally to be automatic or automated is to be self-mothered, which last I checked is an abomination. So that's why I try it. I mean, the guy who made Grief Walker years ago about me, I read an interview. It was, it was one of the Montreal papers was asking him about working with me or something. And he said, well, I have to say something. One thing about that guy, he never said the same thing twice. I filmed him off and on for three years. He never said the same thing twice. Well, that's not, they had an addiction to novelty. And it's not like I'm worried that you're going to fall asleep if I'm not forever snappy. It's because this moment ain't that moment. It's because you're not that other person. It's because I'm not even that person that was around then. You know, I'm doing my best to catch up to the fact that this is all I got. And so I, I invest myself in, in giving my tongue to the line. And all I've got is English, man. I don't know a lick of any other language. And, you know, it's my wife, on the other hand, learns Icelandic in 20 minutes of landing. So I just can't keep up. I just, and I feel very inadequate, I have to tell you. So I do my best to compensate for my inadequacy by trying to be reasonably, not only sufficient, but honoring of the language that was entrusted to me at my birth. You can either make spells this way. Or you can break them using the exact same stuff. So you can tell what I've decided to try to do, mm. do most of the time. I can. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was, I was just curious if, I'm guessing the process of you honoring the language and studying the language does not look like enrolling in a class at the local community college. What, what, is, your, what, is, your, what is your process like? Oh, come on, man. I went to Harvard. That was a big deal. That was no community college. <laughs> but did you get this there? Or did you get this from some other 
Come on. Funny. Oh, that's funny. No, places like Harvard is where the English language goes to die, mister. No, but the same week that I got there and realized, oh God, this is a terrible mistake. <laughs> I wanted to go into the ministry as you heard in the show. Yes. And they wouldn't have me at all. But the other half of the story is I met an old black man at that time, the same week, who was on the adjunct faculty. That means he's the caboose, basically. He was one of the token exotic birds in the aviary of the Harvard Divinity School. And uh, he was a force of nature, this man. He was a storyteller. And so I ended up in an undeclared apprenticeship with him for off and on for seven years. And I toured with, I was his band at the time. Not very skillful, I should say, but that didn't seem to dissuade him at all. And he basically just said, did like that, you know, chose me, chose me out in the same week that I went to Harvard, 1978 in the fall. And there was another kind of awakening, you know, because I was, I was fathered in a way. My, there's something about the scheme of my self that was fathered in a way that had never happened before. And uh, he did something. I mean, he was a thief, which all the good teachers are thieves. And so he stole from me something I didn't even know I had. And I only recognized it in its absence. What he stole from me is my ability or my inclination to slouch on the corner, on the threshold of, of uh, adulthood and moan and belittle the fact that I'd never seen the real thing. I did see the real thing. And I had no way out thereafter. You can only guess how the, the radiation of the real thing upon my life so bewildered and prompted such a disarray in my life as a young man that it never reconstituted itself. And that would be the principal biographical detail that might give some credence to the fact that I know how to do anything at all. It came from the profound disorganization that he introduced, that's not strong enough. It was a kind of anarchy. And he was the, he was the architect of the anarchy that prevailed in my life for, oh, 10 years, I would say at least. I, would, I lived 10 years in the desert after being with him, you know, trying to find a way to translate what I'd seen into a, a life. And I couldn't do it. I didn't know how to do it. And I, I was by turns either shamed or humiliated or disabled. Every time I realized what I'd seen and the example that I'd been let in on, on the one side, and whatever I was doing with it on the other side was just, was almost unlivable. And that's a decade in which I got married and I had two children during this time and began to establish myself in some kind of career. And all of this was lived out in, a, in their aridity and the bewilderment of a, of a desert, for sure. That's what it was. And the full desert experience didn't give way to some kind of more tropical environment until I was in my early 50s. 50s. Yeah. And that's everything, whatever I've done that drew me to your attention and so on, happened after that. But without that stuff before, there's no possibility of Knights of Grief and Mystery or Die Wise or Come of Age or, or any of that stuff. It came from being disassembled in an in a almost primordial way and then suffering terribly for not being able to be reassembled in a way that I could recognize. Not that I would recommend it to anybody, but I have to tell you, it, was, it is the midwife of my ability to resemble that the very nice accolade that you bestowed. That's where it comes from. It comes from the hearty. So he, he used to say, in a particular story that he told, but I knew he was talking about his life. He would say, my heart is broken. I never want it to heal. That's a prayer. Yeah, and I was there when, when he prayed that. So that's very hard to forget when you see that. Well, it's not hard to forget. That's nonsense. It's hard to live alongside that example. But I have no choice. See, I have no choice. My entire life was given over to being in the shadow of that example. Well, he's dead maybe, oh man, 15 years or 10, something like this. So, uh, I mean, I think you can tell. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm carrying his bags.
I'm way down in the pecking order and I'm just carrying his luggage, you know, and that's the way I understand it. I don't, I don't know. I've never thought what he would think of what I'm doing. It's never occurred to me. What I'm doing, I understand to be as a consequence of what he let me in on. So strangely enough, there's a kind of lineage here and it's just undeclared. It's kind of Sufi, like in the sense that it, it doesn't have an architect. It doesn't have a, a, a governing body. It doesn't have, you know, 12 steps or pinky swears or high fives. It doesn't, it doesn't have any of that shit. And then occasionally I will recognize somebody or I'd be recognized by somebody. And it's not, and that's all it is. And then you realize your work is not to linger with somebody who gets it. Your work is to pass through that pollen trail of affirmation just long enough to be able to keep going for another decade in case it doesn't happen again. And then another 10 years in some kind of desert, but you're not so bewildered as you were. Or if you are, you're better at bewilderment than you once were. That's my relationship with him now. He's still the boss though. And I miss him, of course. Yeah. Talk about a privilege, man. That's um, to have that kind of relationship, to, to witness that kind of example and to be so inextricably moved by it. Yeah. And, you know, there's a kind of junior partner in the arrangement too. My fellow countryman, and I was alive, my life overlapped his by quite a bit, Leonard Cohen. And uh, so he's got a remarkable song on this very matter. It's called The Future. It came out in the 1980s when the Berlin Wall was coming down and so forth. And about himself, he says, your servant here, he has been told to say it clear to say it cold. It's over. It ain't going any further. And now the wheel of heaven stops. You feel the devil's riding crop. Get ready for the future. It is murder. For things are going to slide. Slide in all directions. Won't be nothing. Nothing you can measure anymore. And the blizzard, the blizzard of the world has crossed the threshold. And it's overturned the order of the soul. And when they said, repent, repent, I wonder what they meant. That's my guy too. As Hoskins says about being a singer-songwriter in this country, he said, <laughs> you open the drapes every morning and there's Mount Cohen. Well, sir, I can hear the people outside and, and it's twilight's coming on and I owe them another hour of work down there with the lives that we took yesterday. So I'm going to have to take my leave now and go attend to that work. But I do appreciate very much attending to this. And uh, you've been very kind. And been unrestrained appreciative, and that's extremely, extremely rare. So I feel very lucky to be on the receiving end of your regard in that way and this invitation. And may you continue. Thank you. Thank you. Take your blessing seriously. I'm very grateful for it. Amen. Amen. See you next time. See you next time. And if there's okay. anything, if there's anything now or in the future I can do, to help you in any way, I'm, I'm willing. Oh yeah, there is. Uh, we're about to go on tour in two days. We're coming all down the West coast of your country. Just tell people that it's, it's a good alternative to Netflix. I will. Okay, man. That'd be very helpful. Yeah, I will. Yeah. All right. See ya. Thank you. That concludes another episode of the 10,000 Heroes Show. Thanks again for listening. And I hope that this has contributed in some small way to your own personal journey of heroism. I'd like to give a shout out to Pierre for the episode artwork, DJ Plainview for the theme music, and to our producer editor, Martine. This podcast is sponsored by Momentum Lab, our year-long coaching program providing insight, accountability, a community of excellence, and one-on-one -on -one support. I encourage anyone who's intrigued to go to whatismomentumlab.com and explore. Finally, I love communication. If this episode has impacted your life in any way, let me know. Our email is info at 10kh.show, and there's other ways to contact us in the show notes. Thank you, have a wonderful day, and take care. <laughs>